Hey, everybody. Good. Good to see you. Listen, uh, it, it's an unusual day today because the day is the first Sunday of Advent, right? Um, and we're going to do something unusual about that today uh, and what, do what we would call a hanging of the green service. We're going to decorate the building. Uh, so you look around, it kind of seems bare. Uh, and by the time we get done in our act of worship today, it will be full of symbolism that talk about Christ and his birth and obviously then pointing towards uh, his death and his resurrection. That starts with the Advent wreath that is in front of us. Um, and what I'm going to do now uh, is kind of bring us into our time of worship by reading uh, what is called the prologue uh, that introduces us to this Advent re uh, wreath in the Advent season. So the Advent season is a season of expectant waiting. It's a season of, of preparation. It's the idea that we, we wait. We have a whole month waiting on the coming of Jesus and his birth. The message of Advent is that God in Christ is coming to the world. And that's a big enough deal that it's worth anticipating and then worth celebrating. The term Advent itself is derived from a, uh, a Greek word that refers to the second coming of Christ. So Advent is also the anticipation of Christ, not just his coming, but also his return, that one day he will come again. Advent reminds us that we must prepare, I think, for the coming of our Lord. As we prepare for Christmas, and I'm sure you started with that, right? That's what this weekend was for. Um, there's also preparation knowing that Christ is coming again. Anytime God comes to earth, preparation is required. So during Advent, we light candles. Uh, we light the candles of the Advent wreath in front of us. Uh, the evergreen uh, and the flickering of the candles are supposed to remind us of God's gift of life through Christ. So as you sit there and are trying to fall asleep over the next several weeks while I'm preaching, you'll see these little flickers in front of you, and they wake you up, right? They're supposed to remind you, like, there, there's life here, there's vitality here, there's the Holy Spirit that is here. The Advent wreath then reminds us of the spiritual preparation that is needed for a deeper understanding of what the Christmas season is. Now, this wreath is in front of us. It, it's all symbolic, like almost too symbolic, but each piece is supposed to represent something. So the wreath itself, right, uh, is a circle. It's supposed to be a symbol of eternity and the never-ending love. We won't talk about the fact that ours isn't really a circle at the moment. Our circle broke, so we figured out another way. Um, but it's, it's, that's the symbol of it. The evergreens, though, and that's the part that you can see, uh, they symbol everlasting life. And we'll actually talk about that again in a minute as we do Christmas trees and things like that. The purple candles are supposed to be symbolic of penitence. The rose candle, the reddish looking candle, is the symbol of joy. And then, of course, there's the white Christ candle that we will anticipate lighting in a full month from now. White symbolizes the perfection and the purity of Jesus, who is the light of the world. So as we as a family get to begin this season of Advent, let's remember that God loves us. Remember that God sent his son here to save us, that this baby was born on a rescue mission of eternal proportions and that this season gives hope to us. May God bless us in this season. The first Sunday in Advent, rejoicing in hope. The Advent season is celebrated by lighting the candles of the Advent wreath as a reminder of Christ's coming to redeem the world. This morning we will light the first candle, the candle of hope. Because of Christ's coming, we have hope. We have hope of eternal life. We have hope of a higher quality of life. We have hope that we, we are never alone because the Holy Spirit is with us. We have hope because Christ is coming back for us. We have hope because our broken relationship with God has been restored. We have the assurance that Christ has conquered death and hell through the power of his blood. We can fully be restored to the fellowship with God the Father. We can also be restored to our fellow man. This hope is born in us when we receive Jesus Christ as Savior. The Apostle Paul wrote, Through Jesus Christ we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. You know, next to the, uh, the cross, the candle is actually the, the, the oldest of Christian symbols next to the cross. It, it's long been used to represent God. Uh, it's, it's a symbol used in Scripture all the time, actually, to talk about the, the presence of God. You think about, like, in Genesis 1, it says when God created, what did he begin with? He began with light. 
Without light, creation is just an empty, a, a void darkness. You get to Exodus chapter 3 when Moses meets God in what? In a burning bush. It's the presence of light in this bush. It, that's the presence of God as he presents himself and identifies himself to us really for the first time. In Exodus chapter 13 and then again in 14, we see God protecting and guiding his people through the pillar of fire and the cloud. It's the presence of God, this fire that would guide them and lead them on their journey. And in the Psalms, we see God as, as represented with light all throughout it. In Psalm 27, Yahweh is light and salvation. In Psalm 104, it says that God wraps himself in light. And Psalm 119 says that God's word is a light to our path, a lamp to our path. It's the thing that guides us. You get to Isaiah, and it says that the people who are walking in darkness have seen a what? A great light. That's a messianic promise. That's Isaiah pointing us to the birth of the Christ child. It's obviously talking about the coming of the Messiah. And then in the New Testament, you get to say in John chapter 8, where this child is here and he has grown into a man and he speaks to us and says, Look, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This, this history of montage from the beginning of creation to who Christ was and is, is the idea that, that light is used to represent the presence and the holiness of God in creation. And it culminates with Jesus being that light physically incarnate in the world. And then Jesus, who is the light of the world, puts his light into us. Think about what Paul says in the back side of the New Testament, Ephesians, it's chapter 5. He says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of light. The idea that light represents God. Light pointed to Christ. Christ is light. And then he passes that light to us. And I want you to think about like, what we do with lights at Christmas. Uh, one of the things, this, this is my little touch. That I had to do it because I wanted us to, we're going to put a lighted garland up here on the, on the choir rail because I wanted lights in here. It's because of the, the symbolism that is there because that's what we use at Christmas, right? We put lights on our trees. We put lights on our mantles. We put lights on our front yard. My family, we're putting lights in our backyard this year because we can. Why not, right? We use lights to shine out at Christmas. We hang them on literally everything. What I want you to do is to think about when you see Christmas lights, when you see these lights that we're going to put up in just a second, when you go driving and see Christmas lights, when you look at them hanging on your tree at night, I want you to be inspired in all the ways and in all the places that you get the chance to live as children of light, as the scripture said, and to light up the dark world with the love of Christ. Can I get two or three people to come forward and to hang this lighted garland on the choir rail? Next, we're going to move to poinsettias. All right, and you got to make sure you get the idiot on the end, right? Poinsettia. Uh, these red, they're actually not flowers, they're actually plants that just have red blooms on them. I learned that this week. I had to look that up. And um, we use them to decorate at Christmas. And for some reason, churches always have. And the question is do you know why? Do you know the history behind this plant and why we use it as Christmas? So it starts with a, a very practical reason, the fact that it's a, it's a plant that will bloom in December, right? Like it will, it will bloom during the time where we choose to celebrate Christmas. So that's very practical and very helpful, and that's probably where it starts from. But the cool part of it is, is this legend that's associated with the plant. And this legend comes out of Mexico and is connected to a girl named Pepita. And Pepita was uh, on her way, they were having a Christmas Eve service to celebrate the, the coming of Jesus. And you're supposed to bring a gift. And the idea is that you would come and you would lay a, a gift at the foot of the Christ child at this Christmas Eve service. That, that was the tradition there. And she came from a very poor family and had nothing to bring. So she's on her way there. She's sad because she has nothing to give to Jesus. And she looks on the side of the road and there's these weeds that are growing. And she decides in all of her childlike brilliance to pick a bouquet of weeds and bring them to church. And the legend says that when she brought them to the front and she laid them at the foot of the baby Jesus, they bloomed into this beautiful red plant that we now know as a poinsettia. I don't know if that's true or not. But that's the legend that connects back to why poinsettias are then used to celebrate Christmas. And it connects to what that, um, that plant will be called. That, from that point on, in, in Mexico, what they would call it is the, the flores de noche buena. For us, that would be the flowers of the holy night. And that put that into part of the, the repertoire of our decoration for Christmas. Now, that's the, the legend and the history. But here's what's neat about it is the, the symbolism that can be present 
in this incredibly beautiful plant, right? I think that the symbolism of the plant is what pushes us past Christmas to think about the mission of the Christ child, the reason this child is born. The red can easily help us think about the blood of that small child, knowing that that baby that we celebrate came in order for his blood to be spilled for my benefit, to be able to cover my sins, to cleanse me from my unrighteousness. And that in itself is just a, is a metaphor that'll blow you away. But then on top of that, the plant itself is actually a symbol of resurrection. Do you know that like after Christmas, you can, you can trim the plant. You can take care of it, cut it down, you water it and fertilize it for a little while. And what happens is that you let it just, it basically does nothing. And then in October, sometime like the first week of October, if you'll put it into a dark closet, completely dark, no light at all for 14 days, it will rebloom. Literally, it comes out of the darkness, blooming with color. If that's not a symbolism of resurrection, of a Christ who went into the dark tomb and three days came back out radiant with light, with color, and with life, that's what these flowers, these plants, mean to us. They're beautiful, yes. They have a legend that's fun, but they're symbolic. They point us to the reason that Christ came. So I want you to think, like every time you see these when you come into the sanctuary, and if you use them at home or you, wherever it is that you, you see them, you'll see them a bunch this month, is to be reminded of what that Christ child came here to do. He came to give you salvation and forgiveness for sins. And that's amazing. What we want to do is we want to decorate with our poinsettias. They are uh, back here by, in the fellowship hall. The big ones are going to go on the altar table around the wreath. The small ones will go in the windowsill. So anyone who is interested and willing, uh, would you go and get poinsettias? And let's decorate the sanctuary. We're going to move to greenery. All right, and to think about like what greenery is, the Christmas tree, the wreaths that come with them. Um, and what's interesting about the Christmas tree is a little history with it. It's actually not been around all that long. You think that you know Jesus has been here for over 2,000 years. The tree has only been here for about 500 years. It was apparently first developed in Germany around the, the 1500s. And it evolved from what they understood as a paradise tree. Now, the paradise tree was a, like the main prop of a, of a play, a stage production that was about Adam and Eve, all right? And the, the, the center part of, the, obviously, the, that story would be this fir tree that was decorated with apples, and it was supposed to represent the Garden of Eden. That was the, the imagery that was coming out of the, the play. And what would happen is that kind of developed into tradition for the Germans, and on December the 24th, they would set up what they called a paradise tree in their homes, and they would decorate it with communion wafers as part of a feast day that was celebrating Adam and Eve. It was almost like a uh, remembering where we had come from in anticipation of, of Christmas. And what they would also do is in the same room, kind of like across the, the, the room, they would set up what they called a Christmas pyramid. And that had shelves, you know, a pyramid thing with little shelves on it. And it would be to decorate with like Christian, uh, Christmas figurines and candles. And you would put a star to think about the star that led the Magi. And, well, by the 16th century, those two images had merged into what we know as the Christmas tree. Some smart woman thought, why are we doing both? Let's put it together, right? So it became what you and I understand now as the Christmas tree. So the Christmas tree and the, and the wreaths that go with them, our room in here will actually have more wreaths than anything else, but they're made from evergreen trees. And the idea is that they remain, what, alive. They remain green. They keep a sign of life during the winter and that serves for us as a testimony of God's eternal love that is offered us. The idea is that you look at it and see here is something that lives in the bleakness of winter when nothing else lives like us. Like what God has done for us to give us life in the midst of darkness. And in the contrast of the darkness that surrounds us, and there's plenty of that, I think the Christmas greenery reminds us of God's offer of eternal life is that every day you go out and you deal with the chaos of a dark and sinful world at work or just at Walmart right now, you know, anything. Then you get to come home and you look at your tree and you look at your wreath and you're reminded there are things that still live. And that's because God has deemed it so. Because God in his grace has offered life and grace to us. So as we ponder this greenery, as we bring it in and, and set it up in our room, I hope that you are swamped and literally like surrounded in the imagery of this sanctuary being wrapped and decorated in what we understand to be a hope-filled symbol of the everlasting life that Christ has given us.
So what we need to do is there's a, a tree that needs to be pulled out and set up and placed in the foyer. And then there are wreaths hanging on each one of these windows. They are standing back here on a table. Uh, so that's seven, eight, ten people, something like that. Uh, if you are willing, would you please go and get a wreath and the tree? And let's decorate our sanctuary with the greens. Now here's the truth of <laughs> us growing up, especially in, in the world that you and I know. We can't think about Christmas without thinking about presents, can we? Right? That's the exciting part. That's the fun part. That's the thing that, that is to come. And, and there's, there's significance to that. Because we give presents as an expression of love and admiration for one another. Right? Like that's what, at least the idea of it, is I give presents to people to say, hey, I, I love you. I care about you. I have interest in your life. And here's an expression of that love to you. So those gifts, those presents serve as a reminder of the gifts that are given to Jesus by the Magi to come and to, to worship, to honor, to admire this newborn king. Ultimately, then, they also remind us that Jesus is a gift. And we forget that sometimes, that he's a gift given to us. It's not something we deserved. He's not something that we earn. He's not something that we can claim rights to. It's God gifting to us the ability of salvation. Now, ornaments are actually like small gifts. I don't know about y'all, we, we decorated our tree yesterday, and we're going through, we're looking at it, like, all right, this came from this person, or somebody gave me this, or this has history and meaning to it because it came from this place or this location. That's what they are. They're tiny gifts, they're tiny symbols, really, that remind us of greater truths, usually of happier times, often of loved ones who may not be with us anymore. And if we trace that back to what we just read about in the, the Christmas tree, you chase it back to the 1500s where they would hang, hang uh, you know, the, the wafers that they would use in the Lord's Supper on the tree. If we trace it back to that, these, these communion wafers then serve as small symbols that remind us of the, the great gift that Jesus Christ gave to us through his death and his resurrection. That the history of a tree ornament is a communion wafer reminding us of what God has given to us. And that's what, what ornaments do. They remind us of things, of gifts, of times, of events that add meaning to our lives, add depth to our lives, that add like, history and emotions to the season. And really each ornament then ultimately reminds us of God's gift and of his many blessings. Now a week ago, our children made little ornaments for us to decorate our tree with. And you haven't seen it yet, but there's a little tree outside, all right, right outside in the foyer. Um, and these little ornaments that are, that are out there are a reminder of the gifts and the blessings that God has given to us. And I'll warn you, this is the, the last big thing that we can all do together. So if you've not participated in something yet and you want to, this is your chance, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go, and there are ornaments out there. And if you would like to take one and hang it on the tree or just watch as someone else does it, uh, we can do this together as a family. All right, so let's go and let's decorate our tree with ornaments. Our last piece is our nativity scene. And you won't see it because it's, it's going to be in the foyer. You'll get to see it on the, the way out. But I want to tell you the, the background and the history of that. St. Francis of Assisi is considered the first one to ever create what you and I know as a nativity scene. That happened in 1223, all right? So long before the Christmas tree, where he had people and animals set up outside of his church, and people would come and could watch and just look at it and think about it while he preached about what he called the babe of Bethlehem. Supposedly in that moment, he was so moved, he couldn't even say the name of Jesus. He talked about the babe of Bethlehem. It actually was a pretty excellent and smart teaching tool, because during that time, you think uh, Catholic mass, which is all there was, was done completely in Latin. And almost nobody owned a Bible. So this, there were very few ways for normal people like you and me to learn Bible stories. You'd sit in church all day. You had no idea what they were talking about because nobody spoke Latin anymore. And you couldn't go home and read it. So St. Francis created this way where he could talk about it outside the church. And they could look at it. And people were able to learn the story of the birth of Jesus. And I think that's the point. The nativity tells us the story. The story of Jesus' birth, his humble surroundings, these weird visitors that show up, even the wise men who aren't supposed to be there, right? They don't come for two or three years, and I'm glad ours doesn't have it, right? Like the, at, at the house, we set up our whole nativity, and the wise men go on the other side of the room. They're on their way. That's just the way it works for me. But these nativity, and it's literally my favorite thing. Like my favorite thing is the nativity scene, and it's a visual reminder of the birth of our Savior and how weird and humble and unusual my birth was nicer than his. And it's a reminder also of the bigger picture. God actually came to earth. 
Like if this story is real, which I have and you know, we have bet our life that this story is real, that means that God actually came to earth and was born in a room surrounded by a bunch of loud, smelly animals. And it's also a reminder that real people were part of this epic story. When you look at the nativity scenes, you think about Joseph. He's trusting. He's faithful. He has gone on this journey having no idea whether Mary's really telling the truth or not. And if that angel that came to spoke to him was something bad he ate the night before or an actual movement of God. But he trusted it. This man was courageous and faithful. You think about Mary. Unbelievably courageous. Vulnerable. Triumphant. Because in that moment, she has completed her mission. This unbelievable thing that God asked her to do. And she's done it. It's a triumphant moment for her that we picture in our nativity. you got the animals and thinking around there. They're the real witnesses. They're the ones that were actually there. And that's kind of interesting and humiliating a little bit. You've got the shepherds who show up, and they're supposed to be there. So they're supposed to be in your nativity, right? They're, they're humble. They're ironically out of place because they're supposed to be there with the animals, but they're not supposed to be there at the birth of the king. There's great irony and interestingness there. And they're all struck. Like everything about the, 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 the shepherds is they're, they're all struck at what has happened. And they go home kind of in that same attitude talking about it. And the wise men, they're not there. They're on their way. They're down the street. But what's in the middle, center stage, is baby Jesus. And what's interesting, it doesn't matter how many ways you do it. There, you know, there's a thousand different ways to set up a nativity, and we do it a little different every year just to be fun with it. But what's the center point every time? Baby Jesus. And everything is looking at him. The cows are looking at him. The sheep are looking at him. The angels who are hanging above you are looking at him. Mom and dad are looking at him. The wise men are even looking at him from across the room. Literally everything is centered on this baby, Jesus. It's all focused on him. My hope and my prayer for you is that when you see your nativity at home, when you see this one on the, on the way out in just a minute, that two things would happen. That one, that you would put yourself in that story. Try to imagine what it was like for, for Mary, for Joseph, to be one of those shepherds and have no idea what's happening. Like, put yourself into that story. And then do what, what they did and what we are rightfully supposed to do. And make sure all of your attention is pointed to Jesus. Can someone please go and place our nativity scene on the table in the foyer? I hope you've enjoyed our weird introduction to the Advent season. We're trying something new. If we like it, we'll do it again next year. If we don't, yeah, no big deal. But it's a way for us to get our minds straight and to think about, like, for the next month, we are waiting in great anticipation, not of presence. Well, yes, but we're waiting on Christ to come. And you and I wait on his return. And I hope that that creates moments of awestruckness for you, of joy, of worship.